of raising Elijah and as herself a cancer survivor, please welcome Sandra Steinberg. A professor of civil engineering at Cornell University, a name I'm sure many of you involved in this issue recognize, Mr. Tony Ingrathia. I knew if I prayed and prayed and prayed and I waited long enough, I would actually get to work with Kate Hudson one day. <laughs> but it's not that Kate Hudson. Please welcome from the Watershed Program, the, the Watershed Program Director from the Hudson River Keeper, Kate Hudson. And of course, uh, the director of tonight's film, Mr. Josh Fox. Yeah! Woo! Um, before we begin with the questions, I also want to mention, uh, I, it was uh, uh, illuminated to me that uh, we have someone, a real, uh, we have several people that we could recognize from the audience, but we have someone who is a real notable, and was brought up to me by Kate, that uh, in our audience tonight is Lois Gibbs. Lois, where are you, Lois Gibbs? Are you here? Where is she? Is oh, she backstage? Oh, Come on, here, Lois Gibbs. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Lois was the homeowner who organized the Love Canal activism back during that time. Which as, Kate Hudson pointed out to me, ultimately, which as Kate Hudson pointed out to me, ultimately gave us all the EPA Superfund legislation. So let's have a round of applause for Lois. My first question, and we're going to go, uh, um, we're going to start with Tony and Grafia. Uh, uh, but my first question for all of our panelists is, is there such a thing as responsible hydrofracking? Tony. This is going to be a very long answer. No. Uh, no. <laughs> in case you don't know what part of that word to understand, um, let me expand just a little bit. Uh, responsible hydrofracking would mean that the industry would do everything it could uh, to prevent uh, things like uh, failure of their wells and methane and other hydrocarbon migration. And they've tried for a whole century and they can't do any better than they're doing. Uh, and so it can't be responsibly done because a very significant percentage of the wells will fail. There's nothing they can do about it. Uh, they could do a much better job of capturing methane emissions during fracking, uh, but they just forced the EPA to delay the new EPA air rules for two and a half years because it's going to take them that long, they say, to create the equipment to become responsible. Uh, they could become more responsible by recycling all of their fluid flowback and all of their drilling muds. Uh, but our state in its SGEIS and its proposed regulations have chosen not to force them to do that, so that would be another form of irresponsibility. I could go on, that's enough. So, uh, Tony, uh, obviously, uh, as we discussed backstage, we was going to address this issue from the, uh, from the environmental standpoint, but I wanted to ask Sandra uh, Steingraber her opinion of that question, or her answer to that question. Is there such a thing as responsible hyperfracking from a public health standpoint? No. I mean, safe hydrofracking is the new jumbo shrimp. It, it's an oxymoron. It can't, it isn't safe and it can't be made safe. And, and there's a lot of reasons for that from a public health point of view. I'll just quickly mention three. Um, the starting point for fracking is not drilling a hole in the ground. It's actually creating moonscapes in places to get silica sand out. So that we're strip mining our Midwestern lands, including the place where I grew up, to get silica sand because that's the only sand strong enough to hold open the subterranean cracks a mile down below our feet. Lithostatic pressure, that's right, that's the name of it, right? Pushes down from the earth uh, uh, when we close those cracks up. So, so to get the gas to flow, you need silica sand grains to, to prop those cracks open. Silica's dust is, is a human lung carcinogen. It's filling the air of the, of the place where I grew up so we can strip mine it and create moonscapes out of the Midwest 
hauling sand on, on uh, trains so it can be shoved into the bedrock of the, of the place where my children are trying to grow up. And all along the way, we're exposing workers and people to silica dust. Uh, second, we have no solution for uh, turning vast amounts of fresh water into poison in order to serve as a club to smash the bedrock. I've been to Stark County, uh, Ohio, where that uh, frac fluid flowback comes from Pennsylvania and is shoved under the ground, causing earthquakes. And, and that process cannot be made safe. And then lastly, we're making water disappear, which I think is an obscenity. Only 1% of the water on Earth is drinkable fresh water. It's precious. Last summer, I traveled through the panhandle of Texas. There was a terrible drought, 109 degrees, completely barren, 90% of dry land cotton gone, ranchers selling off their cattle, hand-lettered signs on people's front yards that said, I need water, I'll pay, you haul. And the fracking trucks were rolling right on by. There was plenty of water to drill. There was not plenty of water for people to grow food. If we're making water disappear, that can never be made safe. Um. <clears throat> And Kate Hudson, I wanted to ask you your opinion of that, uh, or your answer to that question through, from an economic standpoint. A lot of the justification that our state government and other governments use to justify this activity is that it's going to be an economic benefit. Uh, and in fact, it's not. Um, but the information that would demonstrate that it was not going to be, is not going to be, was eliminated from the SGIS, the Environmental Review, in this state. The reason why it's not going to be an economic benefit is that the costs for local and state government are going to be immense. Roads alone, uh, $375 million of road damage to state and local roads a year. And the industry is not going to compensate us for that. There are going to be extremely uh, high expenses for supporting local government expenses for supporting emergency services, police, health services, etc. None of the people that come from Oklahoma and Texas uh, and Louisiana to frack these wells are going to own land. They're not going to pay property taxes. It is going to be the people living in these communities that are going to have to shoulder the cost of this activity. And also, a lot of the money in these high-paying jobs are going to be leaving the state as well. They're going to be taking the money with them. The, the, these are transient workers. Uh, the ones that come are not paid that much. Um, but they are also sending their money back home because they're not coming to live here. And the higher-paying jobs in the oil and gas industry, the engineers and the scientists, are living in Texas. They are not mm -hmm. living in New York. We had intended to show another piece, which Josh is going to address right now, a, a, a piece that he had, which is called <laughs> The Sky is Pink. And, and inside of that uh, piece, he was going to, we, we, couldn't, we weren't able to show it tonight because of some technical problem we had, but he's going to talk to you, I think, about, about the smear campaign that you've endured. Describe you know, what The Sky is Pink is and what, what triggered that. You know, this has been a very long road. I'm sure that some of the people who are here tonight were here a couple of years ago. In doing this for three and a half years now, um, obviously I could talk about well casings, failure rates that the industry has admitted to and how that's going to contaminate the ground, or what I know about health, uh, or what I know about jobs from my very honest investigation on the ground. And I am working on, and have been working on very steadily, Gasland 2, um, which should be coming soon. At the same time, there has been a really vicious attack on the science and on the facts, and this is something that's not just played out in my case, but also with a lot of the residents, some of the people and their families from Dimmick, Pennsylvania, right here, know very well what I'm talking about, um, that, 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 that have suffered an industry saying, oh well, you could just light that water on fire before we got here. Yeah. Or saying things like, well, we didn't put those toxins into the ground. But there's one piece of this that I have been educated about over the last three years, which is the toxic effect that this has had on our government and on our media. You know, $747 million, three quarters of a billion dollars in lobbying DC for the Safe Drinking Water Act exemption. $3 million going to Arch Albany. $1.6 million into the Tom Corbett campaign to get him elected in Pennsylvania. And it goes on and on and on and on. These are toxic dollars that are fracking up the government. 
Every single one of those dollars is a contaminant in the political system. And what they're doing, 